The talk that you were, you've all come back for because you've heard about the impact that it's had and uh, some of you even know the presenter. Uh, this man is, has he's got a very diverse background which you're not going to hear too much, well you might hear a bit about, you won't, hear, you won't ever hear too much about. Um, Glenn is a, a father, a homeschool facilitator, he's worked in mediated learning, he's uh, had a, a great rich background of, in education and in other aspects of Christian family life. I will, no further ado, Glenn Spies. Well, thank you, Ken. I had to skip out before you broke for the break, and I hear that, um, that Ken said something about this talk was an atomic bomb. So it gives me great hope because I can either do a really good job and it's an atomic bomb, or I can really do a poor job and have an atomic bomb go as well. So either way, uh, I'm bound to succeed. So could we begin with prayer, please? We give you thanks, O God, for your many blessings. We give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for the many ways in which you're working in each of our lives. Thank you that you have shared your creativity with us and that we can be partakers in that. Help us to be open to your guidance, open to your will, so that we may know how to use this gift of creativity and all of the other skills that you've given us to advance your kingdom here on earth. Amen. So I first gave this talk about a year ago uh, at a great books conference down in Calgary that was hosted by Wisdom Home Schooling. And although the topic today has not necessarily been about great books, but rather entrepreneurship and leadership, I believe that the themes of the two conferences uh, are related. And it's my hope to draw aspects from both conferences to illustrate this union. Today we've been presented with an abundance of information about entrepreneurship and leadership options available to the homeschool community. We've had uh, heard from people speak of their journeys into these types of positions and heard from and had the opportunity to interact with a variety of institutions that can provide opportunities for us to pursue these avenues. All, this, all of this information is wonderful and useful for our journey and we find ourselves perhaps at a crossroad. <laughs> Crossroads are an excellent place to pause, to reflect, and ask important questions. And you'll note today during my talk, I'm going to be posing a lot of questions. And in fact, I'm going to engage, I hope to engage you as uh, the community here to enter into the dialogue a little bit. So it's going to be a little bit of an interactive sort of approach to things. As we think about the questions we ask, we begin to understand the answers to those questions in a deep and personal way. Perhaps the first question today should be, what questions should we be asking? Perhaps I can propose a few. What does the term leadership mean to you and I personally? What is leadership? In what way am I invited to walk in the pathway and vocation of leadership? Perhaps it's through entrepreneurship. Maybe it's through other avenues. Perhaps another question is, how do I even become a leader? And I liked Ken's introduction this morning saying that we're, we're all leaders in, in one sort of way or another. What can I do to prepare myself to become the leader that I'm called to be? During the next hour, again, I'll, I'm going to be asking you to, to participate interactively. And we'll give you opportunities to think briefly about and share with others in the, beside you the, these thoughts as we explore questions of leadership and reflect on how studying the great books can direct our journey. So, let's begin with a question. 
And I encourage those who are um, watching online, you can, you can also participate this, uh, in this at home to dialogue with people there as well. So the first question is, what makes a good leader? What qualities and skills or traits must a good leader exhibit? Now it's your turn. What qualities, what skills? What are we looking for in a leader? Oh, and before you answer, I'd really like to give the youth the opportunity to, to pose the answers. Adults, could, we can think about that as well, and maybe we continue on the dialogue at home. Yes, sir? Confidence. Okay, so a leader has to be confident. Responsible. Humble. Yeah. Wise. Okay, strong in his words. Can we say strong in the leadership, in the direction, but loving with that? Yeah. Okay. Decisive. Okay, excellent. Reliable, wonderful. Truthful. Truthful, honest. Okay, has to, has to be able to communicate effectively. Maybe not, you know, up on a stage communicating or whatever, but has to be able to communicate thoughts and, and his vision, perhaps, or her vision. Passionate. Passionate. Yes. Willing to work with people. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Goes along with willing to work. Sensitive to other people's needs. I'm sorry, what was that? Self-determined. I see a young hand up there from Sparky Marky. Okay. Yeah, it needs to have vision, direction, where we're headed, right? Because it's easy to walk down into a, into a ditch. Isn't that scriptural sort of thing? A blind man? Yes. Okay, must have integrity. A couple more. Okay, care about the people he's leading or she's leading. Yeah. Okay, and courage. Being able to take a risk sometimes. Okay, wonderful. So all of these things we can see that a leader has to have many skills, many capacities. Okay, and perhaps we don't have all of these, but they're all ways in which we can lead. One of the ways we can find out more about what a leader is or what a good leader is is by exploring the great books so why the great books it's a good question so let's again explore this together here's the activity that i'm going to do and everyone's going to be able to participate in this one i'm going to give you about th between 30 and 45 seconds just to think to yourself i'm not asking for any response right now just engage your mind think about this question what makes a book great? You're just thinking. I'm asking you to think about the question, what makes a book great for you? One of the things that I've learned with mediated learning is the longer time that you give an individual to, to think about a question, the greater and more in-depth, more profound the responses you're going to get back. So it's not really comfortable to stand on stage for 45 seconds and say nothing. But I hope that the insights we get from that are going to be uh, great. The next thing I want you to do now is take the thoughts that you have and share it with someone beside you. Take, take maybe, you know, a few, uh, well, we'll maybe up to a minute uh, between the two of you and share what makes a great book. 
Share your thoughts about that. What makes a great book? Okay, and as the, as the mumbling kind of dies down, gets a little softer, <clears throat> would anyone care to share what they've learned from the other, for, well, you can share your own thoughts or, or for what you've learned from the other person. What makes a great book? Okay, timeless characters, universal struggles. Being able to interact with the reader itself. Interacting, being able to interact with the, with the, uh, the reader. Okay. So, so the books themselves are enduring. All right, so that they're enduring, that they, they stand the test of time. Yes, you had something there. Okay, they need to be in line with the Bible. All right. Okay, so the ability for... Um, the reader to be engaged in the story. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Um, yes. The book should be appropriate. For, um, appropriate, I mean, um, I know what I mean, I just can't explain it. Okay, we're going to give you some time. If you think of it, you can let us know that, okay? Put up your hand again, I'll come back to you. Yes. So really, a book is great if it makes you cry or hate somebody. No. <laughs> no, I know what you're saying. But it makes you, I mean, fully engaged. Like, you, you become part of that book in a sense, right? Okay, you can fall in love with the character. We're back over here. Okay, so it's a book that, that is open to anybody, uh, people of all ages. Okay? One more, perhaps? Any other thoughts before we carry on? Yes, sir. Okay. A good book will impart a lasting lesson. Wonderful. Wonderful responses. So what we've got is that they're enduring. They're going to stand the test of time. They cause the exploration of truth, which is, I think, when you say in line with the Bible, that it, you know, it has to be true, right? There's got to be a, an eternal truth in there somewhere. Um, they cause us to think and question. The timeless characters, somebody that we can all, all relate to. The ability for us to be engaged. You know, we read family uh, read-alouds in our, in our home, and how many times have we finished a book, and, and we've been so engaged in it as a book, it's just, it's almost like someone's passed away, because, oh, you mean it's over? And then you find like a week later, well, like what happens next? <laughs> so it's so frustrating. I guess that's what makes a good book. It's going to be frustrating. So as we can see, the great books, um, uh, whoa, what does it say? It shows us how uh, humankind searches for something beyond ourselves. Perhaps it's happiness or peace or wisdom. Whatever it is, it appears to be that man is searching for something, 
Perhaps we're searching for connectedness, to connect to an idea or a philosophy or a person. I don't know if you've had it in your life, but I've had it in mine when, when someone would say, you are way too attached to something. Could be, you know, you are too attached to your family. Or your friends, way too attached. How about your music or your technology? My cell phone is off on purpose because Paul Vandenbosch is going to call me if I turn it on. <laughs> Maybe you're too attached to your pet. Or you're too attached to the world. I mean, you're too attached to, well, fill in the blank. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. But hopefully you can relate that, ah, oh, you know, we're, we're perhaps in, in ways um, connected to things or, or, or far too attached. But did you know that we're actually created to attach to someone or something? It's an aspect of being human. It's not such a bad thing to be attached. As we move through life, we search for that which will bring us fulfillment. And knowing this idea of needing to be connected and needing to be attached leads us to another question. Does it make a difference? Does it really make a difference who or what we're attached to? In a world that emphasizes connectedness, such as how many friends you have on Facebook, or tweeting your lives, or constantly texting, or receiving phone calls while you're giving a presentation, <laughs> we're really be, being fed a half-truth. Connections can be positive things, but they're really not the same thing as attachments. Did you catch that? Connections can be positive things, but they're not the same thing as attachments. In a sense, connections are surface level attachments at most. And misplaced connections do not bring us true fulfillment. They leave us wanting more because they're not rooted in something deeper. The search for and discovery of the truth is the fulfillment of man's journey on earth and will lead us to fulfilling attachments. St. Augustine of Hippo once wrote, Our hearts have been made for you, O God, and they shall never rest until they rest in you. So what does this all have to do with connections and attachments and all that? What does all that have to do with leadership and entrepreneurship and, and the great books? Well, we explored a little bit earlier that the great books help us to seek truth. And truth leads us to proper attachments. And proper attachments help us to be better leaders, better entrepreneurs. If that's true, if what I'm saying is true, I mean, it's just Glenn Spee saying this, it's just my idea, but I, I'm going to assume it's true. So if it's true, if the truth leads us to proper attachments, then we need to ask ourselves another question. Perhaps you'll be familiar with it. What is truth? Familiar? Someone else asked that at one point. And so again, I'd like you to think about that. You're going to give you, in your mind, what is truth? Now you've had the opportunity to think a little bit about it. Again, take an opportunity to share with someone beside you. It could be the same person or someone different. Those of you at home, share with uh, one another what your concept of truth is. We'll explore that a bit together.
So I hate to interrupt the discussion, and I just want you to, to know, you know, you're not limited to a minute and a half to discuss truth and then, okay, you move on and you never can touch that subject again. <clears throat> this is the type of discussions that you can have. I mean, all of us have to drive home. Why not pick up some of these questions on our way home and, and discuss them or, or even carry them on with people perhaps who aren't here? Excellent things to discuss. So, okay, again, what can you tell me about truth? Yes. So are you, are you saying that truth then is a subjective sort of thing? Okay. Yeah. The true, the, okay, the truth, so let me give you an example to explain what I'm doing. Say, me and my brother fight sometimes. And my mom comes in and she says, she stops us and says, okay, what, tell me what happened. And we have each side. I have my truth and he has his truth. But the truth is the fact, what actually happened. That drives me nuts as a parent. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to filter through what exactly happened. Well, he did this. <laughs> anyway. yeah. Okay, so, so true. in that respect, you're kind of saying here, if I get in a fight with my brother, we both have a reality of what happened. And somewhere in between is probably the truth there. Yes? Yeah. Okay, so just for the people at home who didn't hear that. So from a faith perspective, truth is God. God is, God is truth, and so everything that comes from him is truth. Anything that does not come from him is not truth. Did I sum that up? Okay. Yes. Yes. Very interesting, eh? There's Pilate staring truth in the face and saying, what is truth? It's amazing the, the, the capacity of the human person to be blind to the truth. And I think we talked about that a little bit today, about uh, you know, in, in being a leader, in, in exploring entrepreneurship, um, in telling stories through film. The world is blind. Blind. I loved what Eric said, that the world will consume what they're given. That is just so darn exciting for me, because then I'm going to give them the truth. If they're going to consume it, let's give it to them. That's exciting. Sorry. Okay. Here we go. I'm going to hear your name, man, brother. <laughs> So, so truth, we can, we can come up with many different discussions of what truth is, okay? And I'm purposely not making judgments about what people are saying because it's in the pursuit of asking the questions and discussing them and getting people to elaborate more on what they're saying that will actually allow us to discover more and more the truth. So here's the question. Can things be true, but not the truth? That's a yes or no question. Can things be true, but not the truth? Yes. <laughs> yes and no, yes and no. I'm gonna give you an example. I, I, this, when I was teaching, one of the things that, that really, uh, I don't know what the word is, confused me, frustrated me, whatever the case may be, is we'd have these extracurricular programs come into the school. 
And I'm not talking about sports or drama or music. I'm talking about dare, drug awareness, whatever, something. Or it might be on alcohol, or it might be on whatever type of subject. And so the purpose of the programs essentially were don't do these things because you might get caught. Or don't do these things because you or someone else might get hurt. Or don't do these things because you might get a criminal record and that wouldn't be a good thing. Okay, so all of those things are true. They're true. But they're not the truth. They're not the truth. And so in our lives, we can, we can be, be presented with a lot of things that are true, but then we have to be discerning to say, is it really the truth that's being preached to me? <laughs> so funny thing, we keep running into questions. Is it possible for us then to know the truth? Is it possible for us to know the truth? Could I just put forth this here as a, as a premise for the discussion of truth? That truth is a person, not a thing or an idea. Things and ideas can be true, but they're not the truth. Things and ideas can point and lead us to something more, someone more, because God is the author of all truth. The more we discover things that are true, the more we discover who God is. So as we search for truth, we must be alert and not get sidelined by connecting with things that are simply true, but we must attach ourselves to the truth. So what we connect and attach to directs our lives and forms our, us in our ability to be leaders. I want to shift the direction a little bit of, of the talk. Um, and this, this section of it, I'm going to phrase it under youth aflame. And I want to begin this, this portion with a reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 to 5. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like the ten maidens who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones, when taking their lamps, brought no oil with them, but the wise ones brought flasks of oil with their lamps. Since the bridegroom was long delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight there was a cry, Behold, the bridegroom! Come out to meet him. Then all those maidens got up and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise ones said, No, for there may not be enough for us and you. Go instead to the merchants and buy some for yourselves. And while they went off to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went into the wedding feast with him. Then the door was locked. Afterwards, the other maidens came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door to us. But he said to them in reply, Amen, I say to you, I do not know you. Therefore, stay awake, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The Gospel of the Lord. I've spent a good portion of my life in the world of youth, and I found that there's often a frustration that youth have with the apparent smothering effect that the adult world has on their ideals, their creativity, their vitality and enthusiasm to impact the world. This smothering effect can cause youth to become complacent, cynical, and angry, because causing them to disengage from the world. 
They can become like the foolish maidens that do not continue to prepare themselves for the coming of the bridegroom. But I say to you, youth, prepare yourself. Carry in your lamps the fuel to sustain your fire to life. To develop the theme of wise maidens, I wish to draw upon a piece of writing that I received in 2012 from a young person who was very dear to me. They write, The search for the everlasting fuel of truth. Youth are often thought as a problem, a thorn in the side, thoroughly impractical and stubborn. Those who think that way are not to be harshly blamed, for youth are often as enigmatic to themselves as to others. I here propose an explanation of why I believe youth act as they do, for anyone who may be interested to know the perspective of at least one teen. I hope from this insight that the problem of youth may to some extent be able to be remedied. A youth is nothing but a flame which has been growing from a tiny spark at the moment of its creation to a fitful and volatile flicker sustained up till now on the kindling of knowledge and truth. It is waiting to explode into a blazing fire upon the first piece of suitable fuel that it finds, the first philosophy of life, which seems fit to be cherished and fought for. When a youth has found one such philosophy and taken it as its own, he cannot believe that any force whatsoever could rob him of either his heat of devotion or his fuel. Winds exist, however, which can either enhance a flame or extinguish it. These can come from the societies the flames find themselves in, in other flames, or even in the reasoning of the flame itself. In this environment, the flame strives to keep its hold on its wood, grounding itself deeper into the wood so as not to be blown off. However, sooner or later, most wood turns to ashes under the grip of fire and thus leaves the flames bereft of its fuel. Many young flames find to their dismay that they have attached themselves to wood that was rapidly burnt up. And then they either die down into a pitiful smolder or else continue their search for substantial fuel, more desperate than before. This can be clearly seen in the disposition of youth. It happens that only one type of wood will stand the grip of fire without ever decaying, the wood of truth, the true wood. The longer a flame is without it, the more agitated and unhappy it becomes. Repeated fuel failures can cause it to become cynical and it can begin to doubt the existence of the immortal fuel of its dreams. The winds buffet the searching flame on every side, at one moment encouraging and at another condemning. The flame feels lost, helplessly passionate, yet without something to be passionate about. But when it comes upon its goal, to which all who persistently search, will in, it will indeed come. It will shine as a brilliant beacon for all to see. Beware to anyone who would attempt to quench such a fire. So do not give up, my fellow flames. The immortal wood which we toil to find does exist. And once you have found it, hold on. That's coming from one of your peers. How they perceive what it means to be a youth, a teenager. Even as an adult, it speaks deeply to us. Perhaps we, we can reflect back on our own teen years and say, 
Exactly. That's exactly what I felt like. So let's explore the analogy of the burning flame, where it burns and the fuel it uses to burn. Where do we find the fuel that will, as the author says so eloquently, stand the grip of fire without ever decaying? Where, we, where might we find that fuel? Any thoughts? In truth. In truth. Great. Where do we find truth? Okay, we find truth with God. Where do we find God? Okay, in the Bible. Do we find him anywhere else? Okay, at church. Yeah. Okay, through each other. We can find it through creation. Fire of the Holy Spirit. We can find this, this fuel in all of those places. And perhaps it's not so obvious because we're not in a great books conference, but we can also find it within the great books. Which, you know, is only one. I liked your answers. I loved them. Okay, but I, I'll just, I could close my book or we can carry on here. So we're going to talk about the great books then. So the great books, in addition to all of these other things, creation through scripture, through the fire of the Holy Spirit, through others, we can, fi- we can discover the fuel of truth through our reading and discussing great books. The search for truth is the fuel that keeps the flame of our dreams alive when you grow to be older like me or Paul, (laughs) if you want an older example. (laughs) The fire that you ignite as a youth still needs to be burning at our age. So it needs to be a supernatural wood that won't be consumed. Let's think of another young person that I'm sure most, if not all of us, are aware of. How about St. John the Evangelist? What do we know about him? What can you tell me about St. John the Evangelist? Anything, anybody. Wrote the book of Revelation. Cared for Mary after the Jesus passed. Very young when Jesus called him. The one that Jesus loved. So, let's go through it. So he's the youngest apostle. I love this next one. He was one of the sons of thunder. Remember that? Should we call, you know, lightning down and strike these people? I mean, that's just, whoa, youth. <laughs> Let's get them. If they don't listen to you, we'll get them. <laughs> How about this one? Hey, Mom, do you think you could go and ask Jesus for, like, a really good position in his kingdom? He was ambitious, he and his brother. He reclined towards Jesus' heart at the Last Supper. He was the only apostle... The youngest apostle was the only apostle not to desert Jesus during his trial, carrying the cross, and ultimate crucifixion and death. He was entrusted as Mary's son in Jesus' absence. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. He was fast. He was the first apostle to see the empty tomb. But he also knew how to respect authority and the seniority of Peter. When Jesus was about to restore Peter as the head of the apostles, it was John who recognized him in Scripture. Who recognized him. And Scripture tells us, So the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was The Lord, he tucked in his garment, for he was lightly clad, and jumped into the sea. It's from the Gospel of John. It was John, the young apostle, the youth, 
who is the first to recognize Jesus and point out the way to others. I'd love to note Peter's reaction. He jumped into the sea. Wow. Did John just light a fire on him? He jumped it. Well, first of all, he kind of gets dressed up, and then he jumps into the sea. Oh, amazing. I, I, I believe, yeah, John probably lit a fire there. John is the author of the Gospel of John, letters of John 1, 2, and 3 in the book of Revelation. John never lost the youthful zeal, yet as he grew older and matured, he allowed himself to be continually formed by truth. The fire of youth, fed by truth, is something the world desperately needs because it spreads. It's contagious. As an adult, the cares and responsibilities of life can choke our youthful flames. Like the fire that existed in the heart of the young apostle John, the youth can reignite the smoldering and discouraged and perhaps disillusioned embers of the older generations. That is very exciting. I know that in preparing and giving this talk, last time and this time as I'm re-preparing and re-giving it now, it's just so darn exciting to talk about the youth. It really is in your lives. It just, I don't know, it just, for me at least, it lights that fire. So now I'm going to speak to the adults. You youth can listen on this, but this, this is one paragraph for the adults, okay? So as adults, understand that the youthful flames can be a little reckless. <laughs> I dare say it's natural. We've all been there. Youthful flames can burn in various environments. They have the luxury to burn farther afield and oftentimes can burn quickly and without discrimination. These seemingly reckless flames can be the spark that reignites our flame and the flame of the world. But I have this to say to the young people. Just because those older than you seem, seem to put constraints on your enthusiasm, know that the older generations have discovered something about the fire of truth as well that should be contemplated and heeded. I understand how constraints and cautions can feel. And while you just, uh, where am I at here? I understand how constraints and cautions can feel as if they are choking the fire within you. But if you stay with these constraints for a while, you'll discover that the flames of truth can burn hot, not only in the zeal of youth, but they can also be very fierce and alive in the prudence and control of those who have gone before you. Whether the flame is the fire of youth or the fire of adulthood, truth must be our fuel. Truth must be the controlling factor of our flame to allow our fire to, to be ablaze as the Lord desires. Because truth is the only fuel that lasts. As young and old, we need to guard ourselves from things that deprive us of the life-giving fuel of truth. Do not be distracted from the worldly, uh, by the worldly allurements that appear to be true, but are not the truth. The fires of hell are very different from the fires of heaven. The fires of hell burn cold with the fuel of deception, despair, death while the fires of heaven burn fierce with the fuel of truth, joy, peace, love, and life. So we're back to where we started, asking ourselves questions. What is leadership? What does it look like to me personally and to you personally? How will studying the great books help us to form the idea of leadership in our own lives? The great books will encourage us to know the truth and to form deep attachments to the one who is the truth and to set us ablaze to share the truth. 
I want to leave you with one final quote from Blessed John Paul II in his final World Youth Day address to, in Toronto, Canada, back in 2002. I quote, You are young, and the Pope is old. 82 or 83 years of life is not the same as 22 or 23. But the Pope still fully identifies with your hopes and aspirations. Although I have lived through much darkness, under harsh totalitarian regimes, I have seen enough evidence to be unshakably convinced that no difficulty, no fear is so great that it can completely suffocate the hope that springs eternal in the hearts of the young. You are our hope. The young are our hope. Do not let that hope die. Stake your lives on it. We are not the sums of our weaknesses and failures. We are not the, but we are the sum of the Father's love for us and our real capacity to become the image of his Son. Unquote. The more we become the image of God's Son, the more we enter into a deep relationship and form an intimate attachment to Christ, who is the truth, the more we can be that hope, that flame that the Holy Father envisions for us. Let us study and explore the great books, including the great book, Holy Scriptures. Let us choose wisely and deliberately the things that will form us, the individuals that we associate with, the entertainment that we immerse ourselves in, the literature that we read. Open wide the door of your heart to Christ and be aflame with the fuel of truth. God bless you. Thank you very much, Glenn. Um, inspired? It's great to see all these young people with so much potential. And uh, I, I, I have to reflect a little bit on when you came in this morning, just how it was refreshing to see the, the life that was surging into the room with every young person that arrived. And so as Glenn's talking here about the fire, I'm starting to levitate in my seat. Toby Lorne is going to talk just briefly about how to access these talks through our website. I'll talk from here. The, the talks have been recorded. They've been live streaming all day, but we've also got a secondary recording that will be edited into segments and posted on the Wisdom Channel. So probably within a month, I would say, and maybe two weeks, maybe a little bit longer, but I think that's a safe estimate. We'll take out the dead space and have everything labeled and on there so you can share it with people, you can refresh yourself and watch it again, pick out any extra links that you'd like. All of the presentations today, if somebody had a website that was referenced, those links are all on our website right now. So if you click on High School Conference 2013, you can get to all of the websites from from all the presenters today. And if you have any other questions, send us an email in the office or give me a phone call. So will there be a, a link on there so I can book the Killick family? <laughs> yes. They can do my plumbing during the day and then they can <laughs> play dances at night. That's great. Thank you to all of you who presented, the Killicks, kind of the whole family coming out. The great, great uh, investment of your time. And I heard a little bit about the plumbing work that has needed to be done this morning that really put pressure on them. So we really appreciate you getting up early, striving hard so you could get here and, and share with us. Um, thank you to all of you. Um, all of the presenters aren't here, but everybody, well, except for Paul, we want to give, Paul is here, so we want to give him special notice. 
because he's always asking for it. So, <laughs> Paul. <laughs> and thank you to the facilitators who have come, those who presented, and those who were just here to talk with you. Uh, this is a great opportunity for you to talk with one another and with some, some professionals who can be of some help to you. Keep the, con the conversations going. If we learned anything from Glenn's talk, it's keep the talk going. Uh, uh, not only on the way home, but, but as, you, as you go back through these resources, but any resources that you've got, communicate them with other people because that's really how we learn the truth. We come closer and closer to the truth the more that we try to express truth and the more we try to understand what others are saying about it. Let's end with a prayer. Lord God, we thank you. And we know that in thanking you, we express our uh, glimpse of how much you love us, how much you care for every minute detail of our life and you provide. Our only limitation being our lack of trust, lack of hope, and lack of charity. And so we ask that you give us the desire, the fire, the strength, the courage to take the steps that we deep down know we need to take, to trust you to look after the details and to simply respond to the ways in which you are already working and desire to continue to work in our life. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Safe home.